I think all of us know, uh, uh, cast your mind back to when you were 10. Uh, all of us know getting to 10 is not easy. And so I'd like to add my, my congratulations uh, to the team uh, for their achievements and to the business uh, for supporting this South African operation and uh, to join you in celebrating uh, becoming 10. Um, I especially want to also welcome all the foreign visitors who have come to do their board meeting here. And, and we hope you have a fabulous visit and come away with some new energy about, about our country. Uh, but also uh, get to dive in a bit, a little deeper into the complexities and the challenges and the competitiveness of the South African spirit. Uh, we face many challenges here and uh, it's a very exciting place, but I'm going to come back to that. Um, I, I remember when, uh, when Jim Collins, I'm sure anyone who's read about leadership knows about Jim Collins, uh, spoke once in New York and he asked us all to reflect on, on where were you when you were 10. And instead of generalizing, he, he asked us to find a specific moment when we were 10. Not that it was dramatic, but any sort of moment that represented that time. And he posed this lovely question that I spent many hours thinking about afterwards, which was this. What did the 10-year-old ask the adult to become? And that was such a wonderful question to think about. Is, you know, how have you measured up to what you thought about yourself at that age, or that age of innocence, the age where the horizons may be only growing, and uh, when you're beginning to stretch your legs and your identity and, uh, and, and create a rhythm of your life. And so uh, I really do want to wish on everyone's behalf, uh, the local team, a happy 10 year old, 10, 10th birthday tonight. Let's join them and wish them well. And Mickey, you, you correctly talked about uh, the diversity of South Africa. And uh, it's diverse in so many very, very different ways. Geographically, historically, economically, politically. Uh, it's a country that even now in 2016, because I know to all fellow South Africans, uh, we are in interesting and challenging times. And in many ways we found ourselves in all sorts of unexpected places with unexpected challenges. And the question is, will we rise to the occasion of the times we're in? So for us also, uh, it's a good time after a, a long day and a beautiful summer's evening to reflect a bit about our own leadership. And I always remember the, the basic notion that all leaders uh, need a map and a mirror. The map is to know where they are and how they got to where they are and hopefully where they're going to go next. And the mirror is to ask themselves, what are they doing in the room and why are they doing what they're doing, which is directly related to the business of Stanton Chase. This country has hu huge human capital that is still unleveraged, that has not been yet invited into the room, that is searching for a role for all South Africans. And I think that's a, an appropriate theme. You know, I, I look back over the last 30 years in which I've tried to study business and understand what's happening. And I often think, you know, we really do live in an extraordinary era. I think back to the early 80s, the mid 80s, the late 80s, when, when, uh, the early 90s when I first went to China. You know, South Africans will get this. We thought the Far East was Benoni. <laughs> uh, it turned out the Far East is China. And we're well armed because we all say, how's it my China? Uh, but who would have imagined that 1.3 billion people would grow at the pace that China has grown with a, almost to us in the West often, uh, who are Democrats perhaps, an almost inexplicable political system that we would have said in terms of values and intellectually even and certainly ideologically would not be possible for the Communist Party to unleash an engine of enormous growth and yet look what's happened. And who would have said 10 years ago that that might just slow down to the point that it starts to affect the entire global economy because it's lost some of that steam. Or that India, the world's largest democracy, after years of socialism and small-scale retailing would create in Bangalore and other cities a hub of information technology. I certainly, as someone who's spent many hours in economy class seats, I'm, I'm built for an economy class seat, <laughs> uh, would have imagined that we would see this incredible level of macro growth and connectivity and energy in which small countries like Rwanda, 
would have the ability to absorb the new technologies pouring out of Silicon Valley and create M-Pesa in Kenya, which is much better than any system we have in this advanced economy called South Africa. So I suppose what I'm saying is, instead of getting older, I'm getting younger because I feel like it's a new energy for a new era almost wherever you are in the world. And I'm in, inspired by that and I hope you are too, in spite of all the challenges we have. I was thinking about three A's. Uh, the first is, uh, is uh, an extraordinary phenomena uh, of, of a business called Alphabet. You may have heard that this week it overtook Apple another extraordinary business as the most valuable firm in the world it's actually what we call Google now I thought googling was something elderly men did with their hands in their pockets but it turns out that was meant to be a joke it turns out that uh, that's not true and that in fact you can build an entire economy out of services driven by technology in a profoundly powerful way where young people all around the world are able to search whether in Pakistan or Bangladesh or Lima or wherever and, and just have access to knowledge and information. That to me is an extraordinary thing driven by the second day which is we live in the world of the algorithm. Now it gives off and talk about these DNAs and the algorithm is the, algori the, the DNA that dominates so much of what happens today. We live in a world of incredible precision, the ability to move vast amounts of information, the ability to customize our products and services, the ability to change them constantly, and that mathematical formulaic idea that we can model so much of reality is driving so much of what happens all around the world. And the third A is one you may not have heard about or thought about much, but is that we're entering in the era of the Anthropocene. Now you may say, what on earth is that? Many of you will know that we live in the Holocene era. It's a geological scientific term that geologists have given to the era of the planet physically. So when they're looking at rock and soil and sediment and they're looking at the fact that we're moving into a new era and in March of this year in London they will meet based on 10 years of scientific data they will call us into a new geological era and that will be called the Anthropocene and what they mean is that statistically and scientifically they're able to show that humans now move more rock more soil and more sediment than nature so welcome to the Anthropocene and what does that mean something critically important for every individual for every institution including Stanton Chase of the world we now are going to work and live in where the world's physical planet is in human hands who of us would have imagined that these macro trends and Mickey touched on some of them are profoundly important because they change the landscape of how we live and work but they do it also at the personal level at the personal level of how we relate to each other whether we know each other whether we like each other whether in our relationships we create synergy or we take away value because we don't understand each other and because we haven't dealt and dug deeply enough into why we're all in the room wherever we are in the world. I was very privileged last Friday to listen to four young South Africans all under 23. They were talking about their lives as teachers, uh, as, as a guy in agriculture, as a law lawyer in human rights and as a young young kiddo I happen to have known for some years who lives his life on the internet and his parents have tried everything to stop him from gaming online for years and I remember him at 10 he's now 21 and he has spent Malcolm Gladwell's 10,000 hours gaming and he gave a talk on gaming and leadership and I thought wow now this guy's a salesman he's spinning <laughs> But when he went through it, it made the lights go on. He said, I've learned leadership skills by competing in multiple games, working with people from multiple cultures, instantly online, having to compete, and most importantly, learning to cooperate with people I've never met before in order to win the game by working as a team. He said, I've learned very quick decision making because in the gaming world, it's split seconds of a decision in which you win or lose the game 
I've learned to compete, he said, because I do want to achieve and I want to be part of a winning team. And he went on about it for 15 minutes and I thought, wow, look at this world. Look at the world we as South Africans are being invited into. And what I know is that too often memory is stronger than vision. That how we've got in the room and what we're doing in the room is not how we're going to get out of the room. And as I listened to those four youngsters, I thought, wow, this group, we can rest assured as a generation that we can pass a baton to another generation who are going to empower themselves, whether we give them permission or not, to make a difference in this complex and challenging country. And so I came away quite inspired. I went back to the office and I did what I just said. I googled. <laughs> and what did I find about interactive gaming? I had no idea. This is a multi-billion dollar business. The center of interactive go uh, gaming is in Seoul, Korea. A country whose people earned less than a hundred dollars a year 50 years ago. And today are in the high income. They no longer considered a developing economy. A country split in half where the north got all the factories and all the mines and the south just had people. And when I googled and searched it, I found the biggest interactive game in the world is called the World of War. And that 67 million people play it, more than the population of France, all around the world. And that its superstars are young men and women under the age of 23 who earn between one and three million dollars a year, full-time professional gamers. And that if you go and have a look on Google, you will see the championship final is held in a stadium of 100,000 people who come to watch this interactive computer game on the screens as the two teams slug it out to see who is the finalist. And amongst the crowd of 100,000 people are 500 professional models who are called game shouters who are the characters in the game, dressed up like the characters who go amongst the 100,000 to promote the game and the culture. And of course, this is sponsored by that wonderful company called Samsung. <laughs> wow, what a, world, what a world we're in. So let me talk, if I can, partly to the guests, to say up on the hill in Santon is the center of the center of the center of the African economy. In eight square kilometers in Santon, which when I came to Johannesburg and I was taller and I had more hair, <laughs> was a shopping mall in a suburb, which in 40 years, the resilience and entrepreneurship and business capacity of South Africa has built that hub of financial, mining, professional services and many other businesses in eight square kilometers. This province in which you're sitting is 3% of the land mass of South Africa, 30% of its GDP, and 50% of our exports come through this province. And I have traveled all over the continent, in West and East and North Africa, and Central and Southern Africa. There is nothing on this continent that would come close to the technical, financial, knowledge intensity, and entrepreneurial spirit of Santon. I know that's bad news from the people in Cape Town, <laughs> where I happen to come from. But I must remind us good Gautengers that we gave them a 234 year head start. Because in colonial history, Cape Town, as all of you Juta textbook uh, memory agents will remember, was 1652. And Johannesburg was? 1886. On the farm, Langlachte, Doornfontein, and Braamfontein, an Australian, our Sydney friend would be happy to know, discovered the gold in the main reef when he was walking one day with his geology pick. And he found that gold ore. And within six years, we'd overtaken Cape Town. They have not recovered yet. <laughs> they do have the mountain. This is a hub of resilient entrepreneurial institutions that are constantly searching to be the best they can not only in South Africa also in Africa but also globally. If we think about our recently acquired small beer company SAB Miller which has just been acquired as you know how is it that a little country like this that is a half a percent of the world's economy half a percent 
one two hundredth of the world's economy can produce the second largest beer maker in the world that became the largest beer maker in China that acquired one of America's greatest brewing companies that built brands across Europe and Latin America it is this frontier mentality of we can get on with it we can do it we've got the resilience and we've got the energy to get that right it is precisely the hybridity of South Africa the mix of values and cultures and energies our story that sometimes is so awkward to tell and sometimes has not yet left us that how we've got in the room is a tough story for all of us and that this great center of the South African economy is a story of very difficult things and yet we're a generation called upon to move beyond that and create something new and I deeply believe that our frontier spirit that got us in the room is going to get us out of the room because as I start to wrap up let me just share a few thoughts about what lies ahead we have great assets let me share some of our killer apps you see how I'm getting with the technology <laughs> language what are our killer apps I've mentioned one a very strong private sector our banks are in the top five in the world our auditors are in the top five in the world our stock market is ranked for governance as number one in the world we have depth and capacity we are a services economy 65 percent of our GDP is services not mining not manufacturing not farming but services that's the South African economy it's a modern economy we've got a great private sector we are fortunate or unfortunate, depending on how you think, to speak the global language of English. And if the Chinese could, they would impose Chinese on us all, but they can't. So they're all learning English. There are 350 million Chinese who can speak some form of English more than in America right now. We are blessed with that language. We don't speak Nigerian, which is a very sophisticated language that few South Africans can follow. We speak English, and it's a great big soft language plus we're in a fantastic time zone something we never think about but we're in a very central time zone in the European time zone with the east and west on either side we've got fabulous infrastructure for a country of our size and I know we middle-class people hate the potholes and the traffic lights that don't work but you go and compare that to any other country of our size economy and you will come back as I do <coughs> absolutely amazed what we've got let me talk about the airport I was having a quiz with a young 10 year old my wife and I the other night and we said so young man who was Nelson Mandela and out came everything that he needed to know and then my wife looked at him and said who was Walter Sisulu and there was a stunned silence I'd been in Cape Town that day and I'd said you know Helen Sussman Boulevard I'm glad we've named the freeway after her because we'll soon forget her and then my wife said okay young man who was Oliver Tumba he said, I know, I know, I know. He's the guy who built an airport. <laughs> That's a South African joke, I'm afraid. So we've got the infrastructure. In spite of the